Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Business Bros. I'm here with Chris Fontaine, author of The Real Estate on Your Terms. We're creating a continuous cash flow now without using your cash or credit. Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, buddy. All right, man. Well, um, first of all, I mean, I got, I got a couple different questions, but I'm going to start with, uh, let, let me get to know you a little bit. How'd you get into the real estate game? Oh, I'm going to date myself, but 1991, um, started building some homes, what we call spot building, right? In infill neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. we pre pre sell it and only build when we pre sold it, uh, bought a, um, a realty executives franchise in 95. And then from there, sold that to Coal Banker in 2000. And from 2000 on, coaching around North America, so US and Canada, and also doing our own investment deals. But that led to the lovely 2008 debacle, which is the first chapter in the book you just held up. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, provoked us to re-engineer the entire business and do what we do now, which is buying and selling on terms. So that's lease purchase or owner financing, typically. No banks, nope. no cash, no nothing. A lot of different strategies. One of the very first uh, things I got into, I bought my first house when I was 20. That was in uh, 2000, I want to say 2002, 2003, something like that. And it was a hot market. And I went to this yeah. uh, training seminar and they taught us all kinds of like subject to wraparound mortgages, um, you know, assignment of contract, all these different strategies um, that, uh, that were good during a certain market. And we're kind of in a, a pretty hot market now. Um, tell me a little bit about, about, you know, that experience going through that bust in 2007, 2008 and revamping what it is you're doing now. Yeah. Well, the 2000, 2007 and eight, which, which most of your listeners probably went through the bottom line was when the values got cut in half or two thirds and, and we were signed on personally on loans, that's a headache. And mm -hmm. so that, that caused us to re-engineer it where we don't take bank loans. We don't even solicit investor money. We just do deals with nothing down. You know, ten dollars is built into our lease purchase deposit, and our owner financing deals are typically nothing down. But you've got to do if you're doing an owner financing deal. In our case, we we have a different niche. We do only debt-free properties, so we're taking over someone's home. We're not putting any money down, but we can't expect to not pay for their transfer tax, right? Because we're not putting any money. Mm -hmm. So we do do that. So for the new investor. I wouldn't say start that as your first deal if you don't have capital. I was I would go with the lease purchase. That's that's a no brainer for a ten dollar deposit. Huh. Well, tell me a little bit about lease option because I, I let I mean we we can speak specific real estate terms, but if if I had never been in this industry before, yeah. I'm, I'm just look you know I got people like for example I had two contacts yesterday that are like I want to get it started in real estate. I want to start doing some investing. What's the first thing I should do? I mean, aside from learning some vocabulary, right. like what do, what do we mean by this lease option? What what are you talking about when you talk about lease option? Uh, so let's do a scenario and then you can bring me back to any point of it, right? That you want to because you know your listeners. So let's say a house is worth uh, 300,000, just to use it a round number. And let's say they owe 250. They could be over leveraged, they could be debt free, but let's say they owe 250. We go to that owner and we say, okay, we'll take over, uh, we'll agree in the 300, but that doesn't mean we're closing the house at 300. What it means is this, it says, we'll take over the monthly payments on your underlying 250. Mm -hmm. So we'll stop making those once we put our buyer in the home, which we can talk about later. And on or before, let's use the term of 36 months, we're going to pay off the 250. It's not going to be 250 anymore, right? It's going to be lower. And we guarantee you $50,000 cash out at the end. So we don't talk price. We talk about cash out if they have equity because we want the principal pay down benefit. So during the term of that lease, we are responsible for maintenance and repairs. However, all of our deals cash out in our exit with a rent to own buyer. So that rent to own buyer then takes over all responsibilities. You know, we offload all the things we agreed to. We offload it to them. So now what are we doing with that whole scenario? We create three paydays on every single deal. That we don't put that tenant buyer in that house until they have a down payment. That's non-refundable. That's payday one. Averages around 28 grand for us. Our students are a little different, every, you know, different averages. The monthly spread between the mortgage I pay on that seller's home and what we're collecting from our tenant buyer is somewhere between 300 and 1,000. We average like 409, you know, right, right around the mm -hmm. middle of that. Uh, actually, the bottom of that. And then the back end is what? The back end is the principal pay down on the underlying loan, whatever it might be for an existing loan at that time, you're going to know before you go into it and the markup in the price. So we might've put that home at like 320 or 329. So you get that nice markup plus all the principal pay down in the meantime. All right. So that's, a, that sounds like an awesome strategy. Let's break it down a little bit. So let's start off with the, the tenant coming in on the first hand. So um, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but you're usually coming in with somebody who's either 
uh, probably not ha not the the best credit in the world. Uh, they're having trouble in some other some, some other financing terms, but they have cash and they're ready to buy something. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So they either have credit challenges, like you just said, like that's that's probably seventy five percent of our buyers, or they're self employed, have that mm -hmm. same cash, but also have good credit. They're just there's so many people that don't know that post 08 or post 2010. There's very few products out there now that are stated income. They're just starting to come back, as you probably know, but they're very expensive. Like you're talking eight or nine percent. So basically, they're non existent for the conventional buyer. So they go into the bank, they're used to doing stated income loans before 08, where you just put on paper what you earn. And they've got, say, 50 grand down for that same house we just talked about, but they can't buy it. Now they got to do two years, typically, of what the bank calls seasoning, reporting mm -hmm. properly showing their income and then they can buy. Those are great buyers because they've got the cash and credit. They're self-employed. They just need time. So those, so step one is, is, is finding those people and getting them in a position where, okay, um, you found a, a purpose. This is a client that, that many real estate agents have come across that they, or, yeah. or even mortgage people have come across where they're like, you know what? I mean, we want to put you in a home. It'd be awesome to put you in a home, but you know, you said something important there. Your money's not seasoned enough. In other words, you haven't uh, shown the bank or the documents or the tax returns or whatever it is on a consistent basis to show that you are making enough money on a regular basis to qualify. And you said usually like, like a two-year season? Yeah, typically. I mean, I, I say typically just because I don't know the banks change so often, but the, the last, you know, dozen or so is still around that two-year mark. I haven't found programs that are going to let them season less than that. And who knows as the market softens a little bit maybe they'll get flexible but so far a couple of years anyway yeah so far so far all right so step one which is i mean and, and that's that's awesome um my very first uh investment property i told you i went and learned a lot about these different types of investment strategies ended up going to another another event in vegas and we got all pumped up because they taught us all kinds of cool stuff and i ended up buying my first property in vegas i paid two hundred thousand dollars for this home um, and I, you know, they, I was young at the time, you know, I'm barely 21. They're like, the awesome thing about buying this rental property is every time you come out here to collect the rent, it's a tax deductible thing. I didn't even know what that meant. I just thought, cool, I can come to Vegas and pick up the rent and it's tax deductible. That sounds awesome. So we bought this place, um, and quickly realized, holy crap, the mortgage is not going to be enough to cut to, uh, the rent, sorry, is not going to be enough to cover yeah. the rent. I'm going to end up losing money on this deal every month. Now, I read Kiyosaki at the time, and I knew if I had a negative cash flow, I couldn't buy multiple properties that way. There was yeah. no way I was going to function like that. So I had, it, luckily, I had gone through all these trainings. And I'm like, look, we'll do a lease option. That's the, that's the best thing to do. Found a final tenant in there, got a down payment, and I was cash flowing. So you, that was your second step is, is you find a tenant in there because they can't uh, normally – um, get this mortgage the way they want to, you're able to charge a little bit of a premium on the rent that, they're, that you're collecting. Is that correct? Yeah, most definitely. So you want to make sure if you're not clear that you can easily cover that, you want to make sure your paperwork, your forms, your agreement are set up such that it's contingent upon finding that tenant buyer, especially when you're brand new. So like in your scenario, if you were brand, brand new at that age, and you make it contingent upon finding a buyer, they might give you 90 days or 120 days you have little, little to zero risk because you're not starting that payment yet. Now, as you get more established and you have payday one, twos, and threes coming in, do we sometimes commit to a property at a certain date to get a better deal and we're very comfortable that we'll fill it? Sure. But when you're brand new, why, why risk that outgo mm -hmm. until you know you have a buyer? So you're able to get somebody in here. They pay a little bit more on the rent. Um, in my situation, when I did that, I was able to finally cash flow this property and I was only making, I think like a hundred to $200. I don't remember exactly a month extra. So I had some cash flow. Now, part of that rental payment was going towards their down payment. And, Ooh. and it sounds like in your situation, their down payment comes up front in my end, their down payment didn't come up front. I was just happy to not have anything coming out of pocket. Well, uh, sure. That was a good pivot that you did too, though. And you it would given that upfront scenario. But yeah, ideally, uh, we don't give any credit on the monthly because, and we tell them if they ask, like one out of 10 will ask and we say no, because if we do that, what incentive do you have to go get a mortgage if you're already getting principal pay down on a, on a monthly payment? Mm -hmm. So no, we don't give them any credit. What we do um, practice, so I'll tell you this, this is a twist to that, is my son's our buyer specialist, Nick, he's very good at it. He'll say like, today we had to deal with a student and the guy applied with like five grand down on a 140 house. Well, Nick got him on the phone, went through the certain scripts that we have, and he said, okay, so, you know, you got to put your best foot forward, this competition, brought him up to around 10 or 12, and then he said, okay, great, now, 
we want to get you bank finance because our model is we want you to succeed here. We want to get you bank finance. And so you're going to want to bring that down payment up to get you in the best position to, to cash this out at the end and be mortgage ready. So how much do you usually get for a tax refund? And we go through this whole process where they're going to do every season, they're going to put money down from their tax refund. So they're going to build and build and build their down payment. And they're not going anywhere at that point. They're strong buyers. Mm -hmm. I like that because you're actually nurturing. One of the things that we talk about in, in different uh, sales cycles, depending on, on the business that you're in, is sometimes you can present a client with an opportunity and their biggest objection is, I don't have the money. And we have to sit down with a client and be like, no, you actually do. Here's where we can find money for you. Whether, you know, in my case, we, we talk about insurance a lot. We're like, look, if we restructure some of your insurance policies, boom, we found an extra 100, 150 bucks here. If we, you know, if we, let's look at your refund. Are you, are you uh, getting a refund every year? Let's adjust your W-4 and, you know, or, or whatever it is that we need to do to find the money necessary to help you achieve the goal that you want to achieve. So that's really, that's really awesome that you guys are doing that because you're right. It's, it's uh, on my end, it was coming out of my side. I was still young and inexperienced at the time. Uh, but on your end, that's, that's really cool. They're building up their down payment um, and you're able to keep that cash flow as a, as a cash flow positive on your side, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it improves the cash flow, but also there's another, there's another level of this now. We have something called the equity enhancement program. And we say once we've established, all right, you're going to bring us this month, uh, this much after each tax refund. Okay, we got you up to a point where we need you. This guy got to like 24 grand over the term. Then we say, okay, now on top of all that, if you want to put extra down each month, this program is called Equity Enhancement, and it's capped at $500 a month, I'm gonna, and you're going to see why in a minute. It's capped at that, but you can put an extra $500 down per month towards your deposit. We will credit your deposit because you paid it, but mm -hmm. we'll also uh, give you 50% of that off the price. But they're capped at 500 because you don't want someone winning the lottery or coming into money. And, yeah. you know, giving, so they can max that out and give you $500 extra a month that helps your cash flow, gets them more vested in the home, but then you're taking 250 off the price. And not a ton of people do it, even though they shake their head and say they're going to. But for the few that do, it improves your cash flow and gets them more vested in the home. It is nice, a nice little hook there too, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, one thing that we kind of hinted on, but it's, it's also built in, we're not avoiding the mortgage here, right? What you're doing is not circumventing the mortgage at all. You actually put in a 36 year or 36 month term or whatever it's going to be. And that is because you want to get them seasoned during that time. Is that right? Uh, seasoned. And the other reason we use 36 that most sellers don't even know. So morally and ethically, we tell them if they're in that home for their residence and they move out after three years, they're going to get whacked on capital gains because they got to be in mm -hmm. there two out of five years. Yes. So we tell them that. And some of them are very pleased that we even brought that up and some don't care, but at least you tell them, you don't want them, you don't want to not tell them. And then in month 40, you cash this thing out and they're ready to kill you because they got whacked on capital gains for a few months, you know? Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. And you're talking about the exclusion. So if you're single, it's yeah. 250,000 married, 500,000, correct? Exactly. So yeah, so so those are, yeah, that's that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, forward planning this type of thing, you want to make sure the client sticks as much money in their pocket as possible. Yep. So that totally makes sense. Yeah, All right, the last, you. yeah, the last little piece. Um, there's two parts to this. There's the part that you agreed on to sell the property. And then there's the part that you agreed on with your buyer to buy the property where there's a spread there. Can you explain that? Are uh, you talking about the markup on that 300,000 300, yes. example? Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch the market and max out as much as we can, but we look at things that the public looks at, even though it's not accurate, like Zillow and you know, all the other things are online. Cause they're going to go look at that. Mm -hmm. And so we see between appraisal and that, what can we max out? Because the buyer, remember, is locking their price in. Unlike yes. going to rent somewhere, they're locking that in. So that's their incentive to do so. Uh, in a flat market, in a rising market, they're ecstatic about that. And if the market ever went down, you can always renegotiate and have them rent longer. You know, it's okay mm -hmm. on both sides. But yeah, that's a nice markup at the end. And then you get all the principal pay down benefit that you captured. Well, let me ask you another thing, because this is, this is huge. Um, you know, when, when I have rentals right now and I use property management companies, mainly because I don't want that call in the middle of the night that my toilet broke or that I got a leak here, that sort of stuff. I mean, I still get those calls, but it's like, Hey, we're taking care of it. This is the price. You know, do you approve or not approve? Yeah, I agree. Much different ball game. Um, the awesome part about having somebody in the home that's potentially buying the home is they care for it. Like it's their home. There, uh, we worked it in the deal, uh, where there was, I think it, it, if it, if it ended up coming down to like something, I think we put a price tag on, on it. Like there was a, a max that we could, that we would cover and the rest, they would take care of it, but they were responsible for getting the maintenance man to come over or whatever that needed to get done. 
Um, what's been your experience like in managing these properties when you have people in there? Uh, it's exactly what you said in the second part of that. We pass along all maintenance and repairs to them in the buyer. So we call it a buyer uh, a letter of intent meeting, and then they go to the attorney. In that first meeting, we explain to them, look, if you're accepted, you're going to act like, behave like, pay for like, and capture equity like you're a buyer. We're not landlords for you. And so we don't get the call. In fact, when we just closed out recently, the, the back end was like a little over 80 grand. Over the three years, we didn't hear from them. They put a new deck, they put a new roof. I mean, they really improved this place. So um, that's your typical ideal tenant buyer right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, yeah, like I said, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be dealing with maintenance issues. And you brought no. up something really awesome. They're, they're improving the home. So they're, they're gaining that equity plus side on, 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 you know, when they actually gain the property, they'll, they'll be, you know, equity positive. Um, the other thing that you benefit or they benefit from is the appreciation over that three year period. So there it's, it's a very plus side for the person buying it. And on, on, on the investor side, on your side, you know, exactly what you're going to clear. You know what your exit strategy is going into it. How important is it knowing what the exit strategy is when you start an investment? Oh, you've got to. So this it's simple math. And, and we even talk this way to our seller so that they don't think they can sit there and negotiate. We said, look, here's our metrics. Here's what we can pay and here's why. And then um, it's super important for you as an investor because you can literally put this stuff on a spreadsheet, which I'm sure you do. You've got these properties. You can, you can do 12 of these, let's say. I remember doing, starting this on the term side, like back in 2013. Throw 12 of these on your books. Now you've got payday one, twos, and threes all mapped out. Payday threes kind of stretch out different terms. You've got a spreadsheet that's probably going to kick out almost a million dollars over the next whatever. Take some time off or go, go at it again if you want. But you have that luxury of, of creating that lifestyle because you, you're not hands-on, you're not micromanaging, and you have these three paydays mapped out on a spreadsheet. You know exactly, predictably what it's going to bring. You know, you said something there, you know, and it's, it's kind of subtle. I could put 12 on a spreadsheet. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is if I'm doing the traditional investment route where I put in a down payment and I get a mortgage and I have this rental property, I can only have 10 mortgages to my name. That's right. And, and I'm capped out. And that's kind of where I'm, where now all of a sudden it's a whole different thing and I have to go into a completely different type of lending rules and it gets more expensive. You don't have any loans with these. You can have 12 and you don't have any loans. Is that right? Yeah you, some, yeah, you said something really cool. So if you look at our, that spreadsheet I was just referring to, we carried, any, we, we're a family business, we carry anywhere between 50 and 60 because like last week one cashed out, we might pull another one in next week, right? So on all 50 or 60, we're not on one single loan. It could be mm -hmm. owner financing, it could be subject to, and it could be lease purchase, but we're not on one loan. And that's a far different from what you just said exactly. With, I got 10 loans, if I go higher than that, I'm like in a commercial bracket and, and, and you're on personally. You gotta and think about that every night. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a huge part. Is you're on it personally, exactly. Yeah. And, and if if things do change all of a sudden, I mean, that's a that's how people got you know in big trouble, right? No they question. had they had huge issues because you know I got you know four or five properties and they're all mine. And that's yep. the problem is when things go down that they're all yours too. Captain yeah. goes down with the ship. They're knocking on your door. No, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so that's a that's a great strategy, and all that can be found in your in your book, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you want, and we didn't talk about it for the show, I'm, and I don't know if he mentioned to you, but I can, even shipping, we can give them that hard copy that you got. If they say they heard it on your show, I can give you a link to, to put in there and they'll get their hard copy. Like it's not get my free book and put a credit card in for shipping. We'll ship it. Awesome. Well, tell me a little bit, uh, cause we still got time. So tell me a little bit about the coaching program that you guys offer. Um, I got a lot of real estate agents that listen to the show. Um, and, uh, a lot of times all they know is let me help a buyer, let me help a seller um, and, you know, close and buy, buy or sell real estate. There are so many things that you can do as, mm -hmm. as the real estate agent. There's so many things that you can do with your commission. For example, you don't always have to take it out and, and cash out. There's so many different opportunities that lie within a real estate transaction, especially when you come across properties like we're doing today where we have 65 uh, 10, like 10,000 people turning 65 every single day for the next few years. There's people, you know, aging out and that sort of stuff. They're downsizing all kinds of opportunities that present themselves. What kind of stuff are you helping agents, uh, to see in your coaching program? Yeah, we do have some agents in the, in the community. And because I was licensed for so many years, I can tell you, I wish I knew how to do terms then, because let's just use some specific examples that they can relate to. There are things that happen that are outside their box and outside their control. So 
They go into a house, it's over leveraged, the people don't wanna do a, a short sale. They go into a house, it's about to break even, they can't pay for the commission. They have a listing, they, don't, they can't figure out why, but it expires, it happens. Um, all of these scenarios, they could buy, even the over leverage, as long as they get the right term. Uh, the for sale by owners that, that don't wanna deal with an agent, okay, go in as a buyer. So you can, you can say to them, uh, look, I can buy it or I can list it. I'm going to come over and morally and ethically tell you what I think is best for, the, for you in the property. That's a pretty cool thing. Buying someone being like a year or two behind on payments with no equity, they can pretty much handle any deal. That's pretty neat. That is really neat. And, and that's, that's something that uh, if you've never heard about it, if you've never been coached about it, if you've never been taught about it, right. it's, you're never going to understand how that sort of stuff works. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, just go to smartrealestatecoach.com. We do have a podcast as well that, that'll introduce them to all different niches, not just ours. And that's smartrealestatecoachpodcast.com. So tell me a little bit about, about, you know, when they do get into this coaching program, what can they expect? Okay, so a couple things. Um, I'm big and free. That's why I just so we can give the, the listeners a free book. And then we have the, the YouTube channel. So I'm big on go do your homework. I'm not so naive to think our niche is the only one, right? Mm-hmm. Once If they decide that, okay, I like that. I like what I heard. Then there's an online academy and they can go on there at their own leisure, fast or slow, and go through 10 different modules. But in those 10 modules, there's videos, there's audios, there's like 90 different segments of it. And so they can learn deal structure. They can learn all this language that you and I are talking about. They can see how it fits into a business model, who to call, how to generate leads, all that's in there. Then they can go off and either do deals on their own or they can join. We have a revenue sharing program. We call it Associates. And around the country, you just read that book and it was probably referred to in there as JV. Mm-hmm. So now they're called associates around all around North America and they at different levels can do deals with us. So we're literally calling sellers with them, calling buyers with them. Cause as you know, a lot of the investors, when you're new, the, the panic is first. I don't know if I can say the right thing. And then once they get past that, it's okay. Now I got to go do the appointment. And once they get past that, it's, Oh my God, I got a deal. Now how do I structure it? Mm-hmm. So we do all that with them. So, so, um, you said something like all across North America. So if I have an agent, for example, or anybody who's just in California, am I, am I limited to California or, or, you know, where am I looking for deals? No, but that's a good point because you're not limited, but you, but there's enough business. I can tell you with very few exceptions, you know, some remote area that you can be within an hour, turn out half of your home and you won't get to all the leads. You just won't. There's plenty of business. Is a, is the prospecting a little bit different when I go into, into that space? Yeah, so we have, you can do some calls on your own, but we have set up systems where the virtual assistants are calling, uh, could be for sale by owners, for rent by owners, expired listings, you know, standard stuff. Or we can niche down to find those free and clear um, uh, owners, you know, free and clear from the mortgage. And only when they raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm interested in either lease purchase or other terms, then we're getting on the phone with them. Or then our students are getting on the phone with them. And so you're talking to people that want to talk to you, you're not wasting time. Awesome. So if, if I was going to get started with you, um, what can I expect my main uh, daily activity to, to do so that I can have the best results? Well, let's say after the learning curve, right? So after you've gone to the course and you've got your basics, then it's going to be mostly uh, phone work and lead generation because what, is, what else would you do at that early stage? And once you get to that point, we're going to work on you converting appointments. And then, then you'll go through the learning curve there. And then once we get to that point, we'll convert the appointments into, we call it contracts taken. So but that goes as predictable though. So we can say to someone it, 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 on average, I mean, I don't know everybody's work ethic, but once I get to know them, they'll have their own numbers. But for the first six months, they just borrow hours. You know, I, I, for example, I can tell you it's going to take you 17 property information sheets that your virtual assistant gave you that said might be interested. It's going to take you about 17 of those to get into a house. It's going to take you about 25 of them to convert to a contract and then about 40 of them to have an actual check in your hand. So if you know the math, just go through the numbers as fast or as slow as you want. That's, that's funny. That's how it works with a, a lot of different types of prospecting. Sure. You got to actually in businesses. The, you yeah. actually have to do the work a little bit to, to get to achieve the goal that you want to achieve. Absolutely. <laughs> no, but you answered my other question. Uh, you know, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Um, and you know, how does, you know, this, this one's a little bit different. How does one, turn around and, and write their own book. How did you decide that this is the route that you wanted to go as far as, you know, getting your message out? Well, this is a good question for your, even for the realtors that are on your, um, your listening base, because that's only about becoming an authority. Mm-hmm. And if you want to, if you want to just cut through all the crap and all the noise of these national companies coming out now, I know these realtors are getting faced by this and buying homes and all this other stuff going on and noise in their market. If they plant their flag as the authority, 
then who's going to get the call when they see them everywhere, when they see them as the expert? Well, one way to become the authority is to have the book. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of people that there's plenty of people and we know a lot of them, but there's plenty of people in the, um, in the nationally that can help them with that book and help them be the authority that just took away a lot of their prospecting, you know, headaches. Oh, hundred percent. And you're, you're absolutely right. It's almost that seal of, uh, of approval. Uh, yeah. getting your real estate license isn't really that difficult. Uh, writing the book I'm assuming isn't really that difficult. Both take time effort. Oh yeah. Yeah, you just have to budget it out just like you budget out anything else with your schedule. Absolutely. Chris, uh, any last minute things you want to you wanna, uh, tell the audience before we, get, before we close this one out? Um, yeah, just briefly. I mean, we talked about the niche. Uh, whatever niche it is, uh, pick that first. Secondly, make sure that you uh, find someone in the niche that uh, is still doing deals, right? doesn't matter what niche you pick because it's, it's real dangerous to be with someone that's not current. And then third, put your blinders on for three years and follow it. And you'll have a great experience. And if you want to get a copy of that book for free, I mean, we'll send you the hard copy book. We'll pay the six bucks for shipping. You're going to go to free, F-R-E-E, S-R-E-C book.com. Free S-R-E-C book.com. You just got to say that you're on the show. You heard it on the show rather, and we'll get it out to you. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to put that in the show notes. So if you're interested to find out more, I, I guarantee you guys, this lease to own uh, opportunity is, is a strategy and it's a really good strategy, something that you guys can definitely use at least to have this tool in your arsenal because when the opportunity presents itself and you can see it, it's going to change your life. It's going to be something that you're going to be like, I wish I would have done this years ago. Chris, thank you very much for being on the program. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate being on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, real estate on your terms. Make sure you guys check the show notes. I'm going to put the link down there so you guys can get your free copy. Chris Fontaine, Prefontaine. Thank you very much, Chris. Have a good one. Thank you. You too, buddy.